Okay, well last week uh, we looked at the fifth seal, uh, which was Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. What do you remember from last time, for those of you who were, who were here? We uh, looked at things like Christian martyrdom worldwide, uh, some of the worst places to live in the world right now, that almost all of those, uh, almost all the worst places for a Christian to live are predominantly Muslim. And I told you how these souls that are crying out right here at the fifth seal are all the souls of the martyrs down through the ages crying out to God for vindication, not just the souls who are killed during the seven years. And then we looked at three different questions. Uh, one was, where are the souls located? And uh, what I explained to you is that the upper part of Hades is where they're located. There's no scripture that teaches otherwise. The whole of scripture teaches that when we die, we go to Hades. And so this is no exception to that rule. Uh, Hades, according to scripture, is located down. People descend into it. It's in the heart of the earth. Uh, so whether it's a literal physical place inside of our earth, I have no idea. But it is, that's how the Bible describes it, going down, descending. It's in the heart of the earth. Okay, what about the altar? The altar found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Where is that found? Uh, where the, the souls are located in Hades, which is down, descending, the heart of the earth. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, um, the sacrifices, their blood would be, sh- uh, they'd be shed, and the blood, a tiny bit of the blood would go on the altar, the horns of the altar, but the rest of the blood would go underneath of the altar. And so, if the souls of, of these men who are crying out, these women, men and women who are crying out, these martyrs who are crying out, uh, if, if we're going to follow along with Scripture where the blood goes underneath of the altar, and we know that the blood crying out is like Abel's blood crying out in Genesis chapter 4. But blood doesn't have a voice. Blood doesn't have a mouth. Blood doesn't have vocal cords. Blood that cannot speak. But as we saw in, in Leviticus 17 last week, and we, we know this from our study on the atonement, uh, the blood represents someone's life. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for the blood that makes atonement for the souls. And that when Jesus died on the cross, we, took, we sing songs like, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But it says, it's not really a blood shower. We're not going in for a blood shower. These are all symbolic things. But blood is representative of life. And Jesus gave his life for our life. He didn't go to, we don't go to hell because of what he did for us on the cross, giving his life. And so with that in mind, uh, we saw this since we're talking about men being slain here on this altar, it could not be a godly altar because it's an abomination to God for human sacrifice to be done on an altar. In fact, God completely condemns that in the Old Testament. We see that when people offer up their children to Moloch, a version of what we see today in abortion. Abortion is the modern day version of offering up your children to Moloch. And so I proclaimed, I declared to you that the, the altar is the earth itself where men's blood has been shed over and over again by wicked men. Godly men have had their blood shed upon this earth. And it, just like the blood of Abel cried out to God when God came to Cain, where, where is your brother? Oh, who am I? Am I your, my brother's keeper? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And Abel was the first martyr in Hades to cry out to God for vindication for vengeance upon his evildoer. And there was some natural temporal vengeance put upon Cain, but if Cain didn't repent of his sins, he is going to have eternal vengeance as well. So where are the souls located in Hades? Where is the altar? The altar is the earth itself, where wicked men have shed the blood of righteous men over and over again throughout the ages. And of course, they're under the earth. According to scripture, the description of Hades, they're under the earth. They descended. They went to the heart of the earth. And so it all comes together and makes sense. But of course, people would try to twist this and say, well, look, people are in heaven right here. Well, it doesn't say that. And all scripture declares that we won't rise again until Jesus returns. And so we couldn't possibly be in heaven. And are they really crying out for vengeance? That's the third question we ask. So yes, of course they are. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, this supports our PNR position that they didn't take vengeance into their own hands. And take it upon themselves. They're crying out to God. And the Bible says, uh, leave room for vengeance. It is mine to avenge, thus says the Lord. 
We see that in Romans chapter 12. And so they obviously must have believed in PNR themselves, all these martyrs. must have been wrong throughout the ages to believe in PNR because they didn't take Venice in their own hands. Um, they left it up to God. And so they're counting on God for justice. They're trusting in a just God. And this should comfort us. That even if the most wicked things, the most vile things can happen to us from the wicked people around there, we don't have to take justice in our own hands. We don't have to bring vengeance ourselves. We can count upon God for vengeance. That God will set the record straight. Period. And then look at the white robes and saw how that is, that is a sign of, from God is just a little bit longer because the wedding is coming. And what do women do right before they, what does the bride do right before she walks down the aisle? Not the day before, not three days before, not a week before. She puts on her white garments and prepares herself for the wedding. And then you hear the music. And then the march starts. And so that's a, an encouragement from the Lord. And some of them have been waiting for thousands of years. It's an encouragement to the Lord. We're almost there. Here's your white robe. Go ahead and put it on. It's about time to start walking down the aisle. The vengeance is coming. My vengeance is coming for what they've done to you. And of course, we know the white robes are not the righteous acts of Jesus, but the righteous acts of the saints, according to Revelation 19, verse 7. Okay, so that's a short review of last time. Now we're going to go into Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. Look at the sixth seal today. So let's start reading in verse 12 of chapter 6. I looked when Jesus opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? As Elijah usually says, this is one of our memory verses, nobody. No one can stand. Right, Elijah? No one can stand. In many ways, what John is doing here, I mean, it seems like he's almost uh, quoting Old Testament passages here. Uh, but not on purpose. What John is seeing here is actually, he's describing what he's actually seeing. This is, the, this is a fresh, new vision for him. It's not simply, okay, well, there's a little pause here. I'm going to look in the Old Testament and just put it, insert it in here and quote from it. It's not what John's doing. But it is as if he's quoting from several Old Testament passages. Let's look at some of those. Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. And 9 through 10 is a memory verse that me and my family have been, been working on. I think we basically have it down. I think any of the children can probably quote it now. Isaiah 13, 9 through 11. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of of the terrible. So it sounds like, like I said, almost like John is quoting from this passage here. You see destroying sinners from the land. You see the sinners in Revelation 6 being very afraid of what is about to happen to them. You see in, in Isaiah 13, the lights in the heavens no longer giving their light. And then you see in Revelation 6, the sun becoming black as sackcloth and the moon no longer giving its light, but being blood red. And I'll discuss that more later, what that means. You see the sun is darkened, the sun is darkened, you see the moon will not give its light, you see that happening in Revelation 6. So you see, once again, these things are being proclaimed to God's people consistently, constantly, throughout the years. Isaiah 34. Listen, if you want to learn about the, old, about the end times from the Old Testament, read Isaiah, read Ezekiel, read Joel, read Zechariah. 
You know, read these passages and you'll find, read Daniel. You'll find the same thing spoken by the New Testament over and over again. Isaiah 34, verses 1 through 4. Come near, you nations, to hear and heed, you people. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come forth from it. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations and his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Also their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses. And the mountains will, will be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down. As a leaf falls from the vine. And as fruit falling from a fig tree. There's a little bit different things going on here, but a lot of the same things. You see God's indignation, God's fury against the nations. You see the, them being afraid when he's returning in chapter 6 of Revelation. You see that he destroys, slaughters the wicked here in chapter 34 of Isaiah. Now that's not mentioned in Revelation chapter 6 on the sixth seal, but I will show you in a later teaching that it happens right after the opening of the sixth seal. The same kind of thing is talking about here. The mountains are changed uh, here in chapter 34. They're changed in chapter 6 of Revelation. The heavens are changed and rolled up like a scroll here in chapter 34. Same thing happening in Revelation chapter 6. Um, and, you know, when, if, when you got a picture of a scroll, you see a scroll, it's unrolled, you read from it, and you're done reading, what do you do with it? You roll it back up and you put it aside. And so scrolls that are being rolled up, that were unrolled and are being rolled up, they're done with. You're done with that scroll. You're done reading. You're done using it. And you put it to the side. And that's basically what is happening. This is what it, God is signifying to us, that he's done with the heavens. Not where he belongs, not where he lives, the third heaven. But the second heaven, uh, he's, he's done with it. He's no longer in use of it, in need of it. He puts them aside after rolling them up. You see again here the example of the fig tree. You see it happening in Revelation 6. Now, the late figs with a mighty wind, I mean, a late fig is based like a very ripe fig or an over-ripened fig. And if you know anything about fruit trees, when something is to that point, it falls off very easily. And, um, I mean, I have an apple tree at home that has a bunch of rotten apples. I'm kind of getting around to picking them all off there. But they fall off, and a mighty wind comes and shakes the tree, and they come falling off there. And so what, what God is saying through that analogy is the earth is ripe. It's ready. It's fresh. For the, it's ready for the pickings. In fact, it's almost overdue for the pickings because he's been patient. He's been long-suffering towards those who are going to endure his indignation and fury as this passage talks about. And then Joel chapter 2. It's right after Hosea, which is right after Daniel. Joel chapter 2. And we'll read verses 30 through 32. It says this. And if you were to go back to verse 28, you see the part where Peter begins to quote in the day of Pentecost when he's preaching. But it's applicable to our current situation is verses 30 through 32. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass... Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. And so verse 31 almost seems like an exact quote. Uh, what it says in Revelation chapter 6. But of course it simply isn't so. And God is giving the same things over and over again. He's trying to get a message across to his people. Um, and you know, when you hear someone... I, I think about my own children, how... There's certain things I'll repeat to them over and over again and emphasize over and over again. And when I do that, what do you think I'm trying to communicate to them? 
if I'm saying the same thing over and over again? I want them to remember it. I want them to remember it. Not only that, it's a very important thing that I'm trying to tell them. I'm emphasizing, I'm repeating it. And I'm telling them something that could affect them in a major way. So when you hear someone or God tell the same thing through many different means, over and over and over again, he's trying to get you to remember it, he's telling you it's very important, and it could affect you in a major way. I'm, I'm, I liken it to maybe Malachi. Recently, I, he, I allowed him to get a pocket knife. And I've told him over and over and over again how to be safe with it. And why do you think that is? Because I want him to remember it. It's very important, and it could affect him in a major way. He could cut his finger off. He can hurt someone else very badly. And that's why I emphasize it over and repeat it over and over again. Be careful, son. Be careful. And God is repeating to his people, not just the New Testament, not just in Revelation 6. We'll look at other passages in the New Testament that have this as well. Not just in Isaiah, not just in Joel. There's other passages we can look at too. Have a similar language, similar things happening in the last days, in the latter times. The day of the Lord. Because he wants you to get it in your head. These things are going to happen. Remember them. It could affect you in a major way. Okay, let's look at some New Testament passages that talk about this. Matthew 24. We've been going through Matthew 24 as we go along through the six seals. I'm showing you that the same things are, it's like a correlation, step by step, what is happening in Revelation 6 during the six seals that's happened in Matthew 24. And in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, it says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Notice the timing of this event. When does it happen? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. And as we've already seen, Matthew 24 is talking about the last days only. Starting in verse, th uh, verse 3, he's only talking about the latter times, the last days. Not talking about AD 70. If you want to learn about that, go to Luke chapter 21. And part of that's talking about AD 70. But this is only talking about the last times. And these, these uh, three verses here, 29 to 31, completely destroy two different views of eschatology. Number one is preterism. Preterism teaches that Matthew 24 is talking about A.D. 70. If that is true, which we already found that it's not, but if it was true, we have to ask ourselves, after A.D. 70, the verse 29 and verse 30 happened, was a sun darkened so it doesn't give us light anymore? Well, go outside and look. It's a pretty sunny day out there today. Is the moon still giving its light? Yes. I saw it last night. It's still giving its light. Have the stars fallen from heaven? Well, not unless someone put them back up there. I still see the stars. I mean, you might not see them in a, a city where there's lots of smog, but out here in the country, we can see those stars just fine. Maybe all the predators live in the city. I don't know. So you can say bye bye to preterism uh, based upon these two verses, verses 29, oh, three verses, 29 to 31. And also the preacher of rapture. This teaches that we will be raptured before the tribulation. Is that the order we see things happening in, verse, in chapter 24, verses 29 to 31? No, it's not, because we see in 31, that's the only reason I read that, because we're not really going to talk about it today, but it's to show you that preacher of rapture cannot deal with these verses. Because after the tribulation of those days, then in verse 31, he will gather his elect with the sound of a trumpet, which is the seventh trumpet. We'll talk about that a different time, but the seventh trumpet. So bye-bye to preacher of rapture, based upon these three verses. So, you know, really all you have to do to get proper eschatology, proper end times views, is to read the Bible. Simple as that. Don't read other man's books. Don't watch left-behind movies. 
You know, don't uh, get a study Bible with all the notes in it that tell you what to believe about the Bible. Just read the Bible for yourself. It's very easy to understand. Very simple language. God does not want you to be confused about your end time Jews. He wants you to understand what it says. So it says in this passage, in verse 30, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, that likens back to chapter 6 again, where they say, and they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's why they're mourning. They're mourning because they can't cry out with these kind of excuses when that day comes. You don't exist. It's all a trick. Like the atheist would say. You won't find any atheist crying out that on that day. You won't find any uh, LGBTQA through Z supporters saying, tolerance, tolerance, on that day to Jesus. Uh, you won't have anyone saying, you can't judge me. Only God can judge me on that day. You won't have anyone saying, I thought God was all loving and all forgiving. Because they know. I mean, the, the words that are coming out of their mouth. They know what's about to happen. Just like everybody I talk to, they know God exists. The God of the Bible exists. And that judgment day is coming for them. You won't hear anyone saying, I thought Jesus is all about peace and acceptance. When Jesus rejects them on that day. And squashes them under his feet. That's why all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Okay, let's go to Luke 21. And like I said before, several times in teachings, Luke 21 is partially talking about AD 70 and partially talking about the end times. In fact, we see from verse 12 to verse 24 is talking about AD 70, but the rest of it is talking about the end times, starting with verse 25. And we'll read verses 25 to 27. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things that are coming on, coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And so there's a few different things that are added here that we haven't heard yet. We see uh, distress of the nations with perplexity. I mean, we look around the nations now, I mean, we see lots of distress and perplexity. Just look at your own, our own nation, America. People are just so distraught of the two candidates we have in president. You know, that's why I don't even get involved in these things, man. I don't think it's necessarily a sin to, to vote or anything like that, but I can never vote for these two people. That's for sure. And uh, people are distressed and perplexed by the stuff that uh, Donald Trump said 11 years ago, the stuff that Hillary's been involved in within the last three or four or five years. And uh, listen, if you don't have God on your side, you, have, you, sh you should be stressed out. You should be perplexed. Because, I mean, our nation is going down the drain. And, and what should the wicked expect but to have wicked rulers? Because where are, the, where are these rulers picked from? Amongst them. They're coming out of their pool, out of their group. So they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be perplexed, but they should be distressed. Because when a righteous ruler rules with people, people are, people are happy. They're pleased. That's a, that's a paraphrase of a proverb found in the book of Proverbs. Uh, but if, they, if they're distressed and perplexed now, wait till they meet their maker. The one they've been sinning against, rejecting and blaspheming his name over and over again for most of their lives. The one whom they used to follow for a lot of them who they used to follow, but have turned their back on. Now that's distress. That's real distress. We see here, it talks about the sea and the waves roaring. Which goes back to when I was talking about earthquakes before, how earthquake doesn't just mean the ground quaking, but it can mean storms from the water as well. Uh, men's hearts failing them from fear. I mean, I think we see this is like a, a greater detailed version of what this happened in Revelation 6. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Now, for the powers of heavens will be shaken. I think this is what Revelation 6 calls an earthquake. 
Okay, the earthquake in Revelation 6, the very last time before Jesus returns, I don't think it's talking about a ground quaking or it's talking about a storm. It's talking about the heavens being shaken. The whole earth, not just a fault line shaking and breaking up the earth, but the whole earth being shaken and all the heavens being shaken. And we'll get in more detail here in a minute what I mean by the heavens being shaken and what's exactly going to happen to the heavens. Okay, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. We'll spend the rest of our time that I have left uh, in there. Okay, so the word translated as earthquake here in Revelation 6, verse 12, I spoke about this a couple times ago, I think it was. We talked about the earthquake. It's just the word seismos in the Greek. It could be talking about an earthquake. It could be talking about an uh, earthquake underneath the water that causes a storm. It could be talking about a hurricane. It could be talking about a tornado. Those kind of things is what it's talking about. But it, it just basically overall, this is what it, it's defined as. A violent shaking or commotion, a shock and agitation. And so like I said, I think it's talking about the heavens being shaken. And we'll see more detail about what it's talking about here in a second. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. I believe this means the sun will be gone for good from that point further. It's gone. It's no longer used. I talked about it a minute ago, the scroll being rolled up. It's going to be rolled up. You are done reading it, you put it aside, and that's what I believe is happening here. But there's other passages I could, I could point to to talk about this. Let's go to Revelation 21, 23. First, second to last chapter of Revelation. But 21 and verse 23. It's talking about the New Jerusalem here. But it says uh, in verse 23, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Now that right there gives new meaning to Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. Now usually we think about that in a very spiritual, figurative sense, but it actually might be an actual literal sense. He illuminated it. And then we see in chapter 22, and verse 5, just a few verses ahead from where you are right now, talking about uh, new heavens and new earth, it says, There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so we see these two passages, I think, that kind of point towards that. We're not, we don't need the sun anymore. We don't need the moon anymore. They're gone. And then we can go to uh, Isaiah chapter 60. Like I said, Isaiah is a great book to read about the end times. You have to, you have to kind of discern what part's talking about Isaiah's time, what might be applicable to both, and what's only applicable to the last times. But Isaiah 60, starting in verse 1, I'll read the first two verses to give you a context. And then I read verses 19 and 20. Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That's the light. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And now I'm going to verses 19 through 20. just want to give you a context there. You can read the whole chapter if you want later on. Verse 19, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon be, uh, give light to you. But the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer, no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. And so, basically saying that the Lord is going to be your sun and your moon. It's going to give you light, and there's not going to be any night. It's only going to be day. Okay, back to Revelation chapter 6. So I think those, those passages kind of point to that, the understanding of this, that the sun becomes black as sackcloth. And then it also says, the moon became like blood. Now, we recently had a kind of blood moon thing going on around the U.S., where a guy was writing about that. And um, 
a moon that's dark red, which is the color of blood, or sometimes blood isn't dark red, I've been learning a lot about different colors of blood. Like if you shoot a deer in its lungs, and you're tracking a deer, you don't know exactly where you hit, you don't have a video camera going, and it's light color blood, that's blood from the lungs. If you shoot a, uh, it in its gut, which is not really where you want to shoot, you'll see dark blood. And so you see the different shades of blood, but this is a red blood moon. It could be dark red, could be light red. Either way, it's red. And I believe it might be referring to a total lunar eclipse, the last one we shall ever see. Uh, and here's a good description from the internet of a total lunar eclipse. During a total lunar eclipse, the Earth lies directly between the sun and the moon. So you have the sun over here, the Earth right here, the moon right here. The Earth is blocking the light of the sun, for the people on this side anyway. Okay? They, they can't see the moon when they normally would see it. Um, causing the Earth to cast its shadow on the moon. Now you'd expect at that point, well the moon should just be completely gone. Completely absent if it's blocking the light of the sun. Um, but that's not true. If Earth didn't have an atmosphere, then when the moon was entirely within the Earth's shadow, the moon would appear black, perhaps even invisible. But thanks to the Earth's atmosphere, the moon appears to be red. It's the same reason the horizon looks red as the sun rises and sets our atmosphere. So you see the sun set, you see the sun rise on the horizon, you see red. Well, that's our atmosphere. That's causing it to do that. And so I believe that's what will happen right before Jesus returns, or right as he's returning, we'll see the last total lunar eclipse ever. Now, it might not be because it's a lunar eclipse like you see today, like when the Earth is blocking the sun, because if the sun goes out, it's like it's being blocked, no matter where it is. And so it could be just the Earth blocking it, but I think it's just the sun goes out, and it's like the Earth's blocking, and now only the light you have is what comes from the atmosphere of the Earth and shines upon the moon. And of course, where's the light coming from? Probably from the Lord, as he comes back, as he returns. Because the atmosphere is shining upon the moon. It's not the light from the sun, because the sun no longer has light in it. So it couldn't be that. Then the scripture says in Revelation 6, the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Well, does this, does this literally mean, literally, that stars as we define stars today will fall to the earth? Well, that would be literally impossible uh, if the stars as we define stars today remain the same size and the earth remains the same size. I mean, I think most of you have probably seen a video or two which takes the earth and puts it inside our sun. And millions of the earth will fit inside the sun. Takes our sun and fits it inside to go up to different size stars and you're up to this and, this, and you get to the biggest star and the earth, the, the sun looks like a speck and billions of our sun will fit into the greatest star that we're aware of. Those things are not going to fall upon the earth. They would envelop the earth. The earth would be destroyed if they even came close to the earth. Okay, so we're not talking about literally stars as we define it today. A sun and another solar system coming and falling upon the earth. Okay, we're not talking about that. Uh, the Greek word to translate as stars here is a Greek word aster. It means this. A luminous body other than the sun visible in the sky. The sky. It could be a star, could be a planet, could be an asteroid. Okay? So basically it means this is a light that's visible in the sky. Uh, and remember, this is John describing things from his perspective. He has no knowledge like we do today of what stars are, how big they are, etc. He has no knowledge like we do today that some of the stars, what they called stars back then, were actually planets in our own solar system. They just look like stars. Uh, he has no knowledge like we do today that a shooting star, as we define it today, was actually a meteor or an asteroid or a comet. Uh, my, guess that, my guess that in this vision he simply saw either meteor, meteors, asteroids, or comets we call them shooting stars, falling to the earth. Uh, and just let me give you some textbook definitions of those, those things. Meteor 
is a small piece of space rock that got captured by the Earth's gravitational pull and it burns up in the Earth's atmosphere about 60 miles from the Earth. Now some do make it to the Earth, but then they're renamed meteorites, not meteors. Okay? Asteroids are sometimes called small planets. They range in size from 20 feet across in diameter to 600 miles across in diameter. And almost as big as that one planet, what's it called? Uh, uh, that's Cirrus, but what's that called, Malachi? That one, it's, what's that? Not Pluto, the other one. Eris. Eris, that's what it is. Yeah, that's Cirrus. Eris. Eris, I think, is 583 miles across. And so it's really just like a big asteroid. That's why they don't really count it as a planet. And so asteroids range from 20, miles, 20 feet across to 600 miles across. Asteroids, they orbit around the sun. In fact, they typically orbit between the Mars and Jupiter orbits. There's lots of space there. And so they orbit from in that space right there around the sun. Uh, they have in the past been captured by the gravitational pull of our Earth. And uh, eventually I think they'll probably do that again and impact the Earth. And then you have a comet, which is an icy... Uh, small solar body that when passing close to the sun it heats up and begins to live a trail an outgas displaying a visible uh, tail coming off it and so they also pose a danger of hitting the earth in fact in 1994 a comet broke apart into 21 fragments some as large as two kilometers in diameter and crashed into Jupiter after they passed its atmosphere if these fragments would have, would have hit the Earth instead of Jupiter, we would have suffered global catastrophes of the kind that typically you see in those science fiction movies. Some of them come out with one of those movies, one of those end time movies like that every couple of years or so. Um, and so there is a danger with that. So also, like I said, uh, the Greek word translating a star here is aster, which is, we get the English word asteroid from that, which I think gives credence to what I'm saying here. And it says, The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. Uh, once again, we talked about this from Isaiah 34, verse 4. Then it says, Every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So what does this mean? Well, let's go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Okay, read verses 3 and 3 through 5. Okay. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places made smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So I think it's talking about every mountain island has moved out of its place. It's brought low. It's the structure of its chains, and it's brought low. And now you see the scripture, it probably sounds familiar to you. It was spoken of John the Baptist, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But we know in the last days, so he came... To prepare the first coming of Jesus. We know in the last days the real Elijah will come in the spirit and power of Elijah, because he is Elijah, and prepare the second coming of Jesus, and that's what this is referring to. So he prepares the way of the second coming, and he'll do more than John did. John didn't do any miracles or signs or wonders, but Elijah will do those kind of things when he returns. You read about that in Revelation 11. And so this, this includes. Uh, the mountains being brought low. So God will bring the mountains low right before Jesus returns. Then it says, The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men. You think about these men, you think about presidents, military leaders, world leaders, people who have lots of money, Bill Gates, people who own oil companies, computer companies. You think about the owner or the former, I think he doesn't own it anymore, Mark Zuckerberg, the former owner of Facebook. You think about Google. You think about all these companies that are so mighty in men's eyes. 
And you see here how they're crying out for mercy with a lamb coming after them. I mean, lambs are so, we talked about this before, they're so meek and they're so, uh, they really can't do much. They don't really have much defense to protect themselves, let alone attack something. Go to Psalm chapter 2. And so, many people around the world esteem these kind of men. They esteem people like the president or the potential president that's going to come. They esteem these rich people for their riches. These, you know, people esteem people who are athletes because of their strength and their skill and their might. I used to watch this show late at night on ESPN years ago called the... Um, What's it called? The strongest, strongest man in the world competition or something like that. And these guys would just pull things. I couldn't believe it. And they would hurt themselves doing it a lot of times. They, you wouldn't know about it afterwards. They'd be pulling like 18 wheelers. And they were esteemed for their might because they wanted to be called the strongest man in the world. And so these kind of men are esteemed. You see, you see um, military leaders are esteemed, whether it's General MacArthur or other uh, Napoleon, Hitler, these people are esteemed by people because of the might they did. But let's, let's see what it says in Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. <laughs> he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give the nations of your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So it talks about these same rulers, these same mighty men, these rich men, these great men, these commanding men that Revelation 6, 6 is talking about, I believe he's talking about right here. And look what they're doing. They're, they're taking counsel against God and against his will. Well, that's never successful. That's never successful. That's very foolish. And that's why God laughs at them. God laughs at them. He laughs at these fools who think they can win against God. And we'll talk as we get into Revelation. We'll talk about exactly what's going to happen at the very end, right before Jesus returns. And when he does return, what he'll do to the wicked in great detail. But... Uh, you see the admonition at the end, though. It says this. What well, does in verse 9 what, he's going to, what Jesus is going to do to them when he takes the earth as possession? Because these, these men, you know, most, most wars, most men, what are they really fighting? They're fighting over land. They're fighting over property. Sometimes because of the resources that are found underneath of it, the resources that are found on it, just to have a bigger piece of property so they can say, look how big my land is. But it all belongs to God. He's going to come back and take possession of it because God is giving it to Jesus. And, but then God gives, a kind, I think, a kind word of admonition to these wicked men who are plotting against him. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. So is it possible to be a leader in some way? I'm not talking about church leadership, but a leader in some way in the world. And be a Christian, yeah. We've got to go follow this right here. Verses 10 and 11 and 12. If you can follow that and be a leader, then praise the Lord. Use your influence for the good, for the glory of God. But most people, they get involved in leadership. They get corrupted in some way. Where they allow it to become idolatry to them. They put all their time and effort to it more than they should. Or they just become wicked and become perverted and become corrupted by the people around them. And so that's God's admonition to them. Of course, it doesn't have to be. I mean, you see kings and even Israel, and like David. I mean, he didn't allow, he did sin with Bathsheba, but he didn't allow the people around him to corrupt him. And what he did with her wasn't necessarily as a result of him being a king. There's other godly kings in Judah 
throughout the Old Testament. And so they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. They, they followed God like David did. And so it can be done, but it's, it's, in this day, it's almost practically impossible. So you be careful. If you're given a chance to be in leadership or authority, be careful. Be careful. Be very careful. So they were brought down. And then we also see in Isaiah chapter 2, another passage talks about this very similar thing. Isaiah 2, verses 12 through 22. It says this, I believe, talking about the same thing in Revelation 6, talking about the way this, these leaders, these men, these mighty men will be when Jesus returns. Verse 12, Isaiah 2, For there the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower and upon every fortified wall, Upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all the beautiful sloops. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. From the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. In that day, a man will cast away his idols of silver, and his idols of gold, which they made, each for himself to worship, to the moles and bats, to go into the cleft of the rocks, and into the crags of the rugged rocks, from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Now listen to what verse 20 is admission to you concerning your attitude towards these type of leaders who are here in this day and age. Sever yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? People, man, I mean, even Christians are trusting in these world leaders, these leaders, to help them and save them in some way, politically, governmentally. But they're going to be these people. They're going to be these people who Jesus is talking about, who Isaiah is talking about here. It says, sever yourself from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? What can he do for you? Sever yourself from your trusting in him. Sever yourself from your depending upon him to give you some kind of help. Because who can help you? The Lord can help you. These men can't help you. The Lord can help you. He's the one who can ultimately help you. And then we see, uh, once again, in Revelation 6, 16 through 17, we see these men, as I mentioned earlier, we see them uh, hiding and rocks and asking the rocks to fall upon them because a lamb is coming. These, these mighty men. I mean, what, what would you do if you saw a man who you thought was mighty, who you thought was strong, who you thought was significant, who you thought was a great leader, great military leader, and then a lamb is chasing him down? A lamb is chasing him. He's running away like a little girl, screaming like a girl. You'd probably laugh, right? That's what you'd do. You'd laugh. Why is that guy running from that lamb? This harmless little lamb. And that's what God, God's going to bring them low. Only he will be exalted in that day. They exalt themselves now. Look at me. Money, money, money. Power, power, power. And, uh, but one day they're going to be brought down low. These poor, pitiful, macho men hiding from a lamb. And then they say, who is able to stand? As I said earlier, Elijah likes to say, nobody can stand. Psalm 1.5 confirms that. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now I want to give you one more exhortation from Luke 21, and then I'll close out the teaching for today. We were reading Luke 21 earlier. Go back there just for a second here and read the last part of it. This is what Jesus says to them right before they go up to the Mount of Olives, and he gives them Matthew 24. Verse 34 through 36. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now we just read in Psalm 1-5 
that the wicked can't stand before God. So to stand, you must be righteous. And I want you to, I want to point out here, the carousing and drunkenness, which we all, I mean, everyone thinks those things are sinful. That's a person to be a Christian. But what's along with that? The cares of this life. Well, the cares of this life drag you down. Or you forget about Jesus, forget about his return, forget about watching and waiting and praying and living holy so you can stand before him on a day. Cares of this life. I, I'll tell you lately, you can pray for me. I, I've been having difficulty prioritizing everything I'm doing. So it's been, been difficult for me, so you can pray for me for that. But uh, cares of this life, they can be just as dangerous as, you know, I don't think anyone else would go out and get drunk. Just dangerous as that. So don't uh, think it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. And we should, we should think about it the same way we think about drunkenness. And if you would never consider getting drunk, you should never consider letting the cares of this life drag you down. The Lord wants you to be encouraged and he wants you to follow him. And, and his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Not heavy. Not hard. Easy light. And if you feel like it's, it's not easy, you feel like it's too heavy, then maybe you're carrying something you shouldn't be carrying. So make sure what you're not supposed to be carrying, you give to Jesus. And what you are supposed to be carrying, you're doing with his help. And then the cares of his life will not drag you down. Okay, open the floor for questions, objections, or additions. Well, no, the fifth seal at the very end of it, it says, uh, wait a little while longer until the rest of your servants are killed. Oh, yeah, right. So there's going to be some more killing. But we're, we're close to the end, though. Right, it's really close. That's why he's giving them the white garments. Yeah, I'm a little tired this morning. So. That's all right. <clears throat> yeah, another thing I want to just add, uh, kind of help uh, a lot of things you already said about the size moves. Uh, we already know that uh, not all, but most tsunamis, which is the, the huge waves that are hundreds of miles long that go across the ocean, yep. uh, most of those are actually caused by seismic activity, right. earthquakes. Underneath the ground, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's uh, one thing we already know about. And also another thing that causes tsunamis is chunks of uh, mountains or chunks of volcanoes falling into the sea. That's actually happened where a big chunk of a volcano would fall into the sea and cause a huge tsunami to travel across the ocean. Huh. Uh, so those are some things that we've actually seen take place. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting. So I add, add, another thing I want to add is uh, 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 what if the, you know, whenever the sun is gone, right, and say it's instantly gone, uh, the actual light from the sun will still be there for at least an hour or two uh, traveling to the earth. It wouldn't be until the last light got to the earth that the light would be completely gone. So at least for an hour or two, if that eclipse is, you know, just like what you're, you're saying it could be, yep. uh, that light would still be behind the moon, even though the sun is already gone. Right. And then, then it takes a while for that to disappear. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's just another interesting tidbit uh, to throw in. That makes sense. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. It's good. The, the, the light has a speed. And there's a time constant in this solar system that we know how fast light goes. Right. Now, obviously, we don't know how fast the light is going outside the solar system. Right. Um, everybody assumes it's the same. But, uh, That's the assumption they make and why they think, they think the, the universe is millions of years old because right. these, these stars are millions of light years away. And they still could be really far away like that. That doesn't change a lot of things, but they, they, maybe they're not. I'm just, I'm just saying. No, I think they are. Yeah. But, light, you know, Millions of light light years is a speed is a speed. It's right. a distance. Speed. It's a distance. So it's not it's not talking about we don't know how fast light is traveling right. out there. In other places outside our universe, right? But I'm sure they probably are that far away, but light could be traveling faster out there. Right. It could be faster or slower, you know. Uh, so I just wanted to add that that you know, it would take a while after the sun is gone yeah. for that light to reach Earth. Right. So I just want to throw that in there. And uh, one thing I was kinda you know, something just kind of jumped out at me just now, and I don't know if I've ever really seen it this way before. Obviously, um, in uh, verse 16, 
uh, where they're saying the mountains and the rocks fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, that they're actually able to see him. Right? And this is the sixth seal. Uh, Jesus doesn't actually come down to earth until the seventh seal, which hasn't been opened yet. So well, I mean, a sixth seal, I, mean, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, is, I think it's aligned with the seventh trumpet. And so you're going to see him in the clouds. Okay, so in great power. The sixth seal and the seventh seal open at the same time. No, seventh seal is open at the same time. Seventh seal is a, there's, there's silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Oh, okay. That's for half an hour. Okay, so that's, that's not. Uh, okay, so the seventh seal is not when Jesus returns, but he's actually returning on the sixth seal. Yep. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, that's all I have. All right.